everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Maria Howell and I am Director of Alumni and Family Engagement and a proud member of the class of 1991. I am thrilled to welcome you all to our virtual book club discussion with Sherry Reynolds, author of the play Orabelle's Wheelbarrow and the novels Bitterroot Landing, A Gracious Plenty, Firefly Cloak, The Sweet In Between, The Homespun Wisdom of Myrtle T. Crib, The Tender Grave, Grave, and The Rapture of Canaan, from which she'll read tonight. It was an Oprah Book Club selection and New York Times bestseller when it was released. Sherry grew up in a large extended family in rural South Carolina. She graduated from Conway High School, our own Davidson College in 1989, and Virginia Commonwealth University. She teaches creative writing and literature at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, where she serves as the Ruth and Perry Morgan Chair of Southern Literature. She's also taught at Virginia Commonwealth University, the College of William and Mary, and lucky for us at Davidson College. For those of you joining us, Sherry and I will have a conversation. She'll read for us and then I'll get to the questions submitted online in advance before we open it up to questions from the audience. If you have questions for Sherry throughout the event, place them in the Zoom chat as you think of them and we'll try to get to as many as we can. If you think about it, add your name and class year if relevant, if you don't mind my using it when asking the question to Sherry. And a final reminder that we may discuss some book spoilers. So if you haven't finished reading the book, The Rapture of Canaan, this is your warning. Sherry, thank you so much for being here. Um, where am I speaking to you right now? And did you teach class today? I did not teach today, but you are speaking to me in my office. Um, so I am at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, where I am in the English department. And right now I'm the department chair um, of the English department. And so I, um, I came here today from Cape Charles, where I live um, for, for my real life. And I came back up here to work this afternoon. So. Well, we're so glad that you were able to join us tonight. Um, if it's okay with you, let's start out with some questions that guests submitted ahead of time about your overall writing process. Several people were really interested in hearing about that. Can you describe what the overall writing process looks for you? And do you organize or outline the story before you start writing? Or do you start with a kernel of an idea and then write creating the novel as you go? Well... Thank you for asking. Um, I have never done it twice the same way. And every book comes to me in, in a different way. And I usually don't know what it is that I've got when I get started, right? So, um, so my process at first is just to kind of follow, um, to follow the thing that is interesting me, piquing my interest, exciting me, um, whatever I'm passionate about and see kind of where it leads. And usually I'll uncover sort of a problem. And it's usually a problem about a character that's in some kind of a situation that they don't wanna be in. And then I start backing up and going, well, how'd they get here? And you know, where did this come from? Um, but, but they're always quite different. Once I get, um, so I usually write without any kind of an outline. I don't think I've ever had an outline. Um, that, that's just not how it starts for me. And I write my way into it. Um, I write by longhand a lot at the beginning because it usually starts as like a journal piece or something. And then, um, and then I'll type it up. And when I get where I don't know what else to do, I print it and I look at it and I sort of right on that draft and I flip those pages over and fill out the backs of those pages and I type that in. And after a couple of times of that, I sort of have a better picture of what I'm doing. But usually I write through a whole draft before I really understand what the book is about. Um, so it takes a while in that kind of a way. Um, but I'm not much of a planner because, not at the beginning, because I'm still um, I'm still exploring the people, really, and, and how they showed up there. So, 
It's so sweet to see you all here. And I don't know all of you, but I know some of you. And I thank you for being here. And um, and it it always makes me so nervous to do this kind of thing. But I got a list of who had signed up to come um, earlier today. And I went through that list and I saw so many old friends and classmates. And um, and it, it made me kind of relax and it made me smile. And so it, it helped me to get through this today. So I just want to tell you that, that I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. I'm sure your listeners are thrilled and would love to have a chance to talk to you one-on-one -on -one as well. I feel lucky to have a chance to sit down and talk to you and just have this conversation. I've lost my sound. You lost your sound. Oh, no, yeah, I, I didn't, didn't hear you. Did you just ask me a question? I'm so sorry. Um, I'm at my office, which should be perfectly working. Is it working right now? It's working now. Let's go again. Excellent. Um, I was saying thank you so much for um, sharing that with us. Um, I have been an outliner my whole life, and so I love hearing the free-flowing um, drafts that you've done. Current parent, um, Christopher O'Byrne asks, as a teacher, do you share your works in progress with your students? And if so, in what ways do you share and how much do you share? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, generally speaking, I do not share um, my works in progress with my students, but I might if there was some good reason to. Um, when I'm in my classes, I'm I'm mindful of what they need and, and I try to keep myself out of it as much as I can. But with, um, so I've taught, I teach English classes, but I teach, I teach general education literature classes sometimes. And sometimes I teach graduate students in the MFA program in creative writing. When I'm working with the grad students, I very frequently refer to my experiences as a writer. And I have shared many times things that I thought that they could use. And, you know, even just like last week when I was with my class, I, I was talking with them about an experience that I had had with an editor and how I, um, how, how embarrassed I was that I had an editor point out um, a pattern that I had been using for the last 25 years and didn't know. And, you know, so how, you know, that these, these things happen. And sometimes it can be like an editor at a little literary journal that'll show you something that your novel editors never mentioned. And, and so it's always it's always growth. But um, but but I've taught classes before where the students did not even know I write and didn't care. And then I've taught classes where it was really, um, you know, I was teaching them because these students wanted to be writers. And so in those cases, I do sometimes refer to my to my path. Um, and especially when I can when I can give them advice based on what I've learned. Well, thanks so much for giving some advice here tonight. Um, Along those lines of having someone point out things to you, is there an English grammar lesson that you've been dying to teach other people or get off your chest, some kind of a pet peeve that you have? That's funny. Um, so not really a, a grammar lesson. Um, I have to I have to relax about that these days more than I than I would like sometimes I do like that Oxford comma um, it's hard to to convince everybody about that but I have some words that drive me up the wall I cannot bear um, relatable and I cannot bear the word impactful and people use those words all the time. My students are always talking about what's relatable and what isn't, and it is everything I can do not to, um, to, to work on that habit. But I know that, you know, language evolves and we have to too, and I'm probably the last one in line for it, but those words drive me just absolutely crazy. <laughs> Taking nouns and making them into verbs, right? Not that it matters. Now, I like a good gerund, but I can't do relatable. That one is really hard for me. <laughs> Impactful bothers me too. Yeah, that's hard. Um, <laughs> Um, Heather Jamison, class of 1985, asked, what one piece of advice would you give to would-be novelists? Oh, gosh. Um, the... <sighs> I can't give one piece. I've never given one piece of advice in my life. I always have a, if I'm going to give advice, I'd give it out by the buckets. But I think that, um, that there's, there, there are two, two things. I can get it down to two. And that is you have to have passion about whatever it is that you're writing about. It has to be a story that you're passionate 
and believe needs to be told, right? Like that is a huge piece, but the other piece that goes with it is the discipline and the dedication. Um, there are a lot of people that that wanna, um, wanna be novelists, but there's a difference in being a novelist and writing a novel. And part of that is just like the drudgery that it's not romantic, it's not even fun. And I know that there are some people in here who do it and it, it's work, it's hard, hard work. And so it's that, it's staying with it even when it doesn't come out right the first time. Um, um, you know, the tenacity that goes with it, but also the passion for it. That's Can I give great. a little bit more advice though? In yes. case, okay, because I think that the, if I were going to go one step down on it, I would say that it's really important to read, um, well, to read things twice, like to read things for their enjoyment, for their meaning, um, for for their their literary quality even, but then to read again structurally and to, to look at the architecture of whatever it is you're reading and question why um, or how that design contributes to what that story is. So that's the student part of it, right? Is because the discipline and the passion, those aren't the, the, the student pieces, but you really need to study, I think, if you want to, um, to master that craft. So passion, discipline, and architecture. Asking yeah. why you're in here. Yeah. Um, Bobby, how class of 1987 asks, were there any particular experiences at Davidson or any specific Davidson professors who influenced your decision to become a writer educator? Well, yeah, um, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, I mean, I don't think, I, I wouldn't have, have pursued this. I wouldn't have followed this dream if it had not been for Elizabeth Mills. Um, and so, so Dr. Elizabeth Mills was my composition teacher, my freshman composition teacher, and I did not want to take freshman composition, and I didn't think I should have to take freshman composition. I just didn't score quite high enough on that AP exam. I was close, but I didn't get it, and I went into that class with a little chip on my shoulder because I believed that I was already a good writer, and in my very first paper for that class, and I will never forget this, she gave me a C and I about died. And I went to talk to her and said, I don't write C papers. And she said, you did this time. And then she just sat with me and she showed me things that really helped me see in one assignment, one assignment, um, ways that, um, some habits that I had and some moves that I kept making. And, um, and then beyond that, so I was, I didn't know how lucky I was. I didn't want to take that class and I didn't really like the assignments, but I loved writing and I loved um, that those were the things I had to spend my time on. And um, as, as, as I went along at Davidson, she was so encouraging to me and was just like, okay, come on, have another English class. All right, let's get you here as a major. All right, did you submit that story yet for the Vereen Bell Award or whatever? She just had my back um, the whole time I was there and even after I left. And so she was just so, so important to me. And then I'll also mention, of course, I worked with Tony Abbott. And Tony was um, just, he was, he was such a wonderful teacher for me. And he gave me such freedom to, um, to explore the voices that I had in my head and the different forms that I had. I studied with Cynthia Lewis. She gave me some harsh criticism that I really pushed against, but learned so much from. Um, so appreciate her feedback on my, on my work. But I did my work study um, in um, the theater and I loved being in the theater, and I wasn't ever in a single play at Davidson, but I loved working behind the scenes, and I loved being in a place where people got into character. It was such a dream space, and that kind of, um, that kind of creative energy, like some of my assignments would be, you know, well, we have to build the box where Sweeney Todd's going to fall into when he gets, you know, where, where, where all these murder people are going to fall into, or we need a costume for whatever this is. And to be able to put that together, those were great assignments for me as an imaginative person. And it just folded right in with my, um, with my writing work too. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm sure that many of the people on this call will have similar stories of feedback if they ever took Dr. Mills, Dr. Abbott, and Dr. Lewis. I certainly do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> along those lines, Bill Bevin, Bivens, class of 1953, asks, what courses have been most helpful in your writing career? That could be, I guess, at Davidson, Virginia, um, Commonwealth University as well. Any specific type of course? I've never had a course that wasn't helpful to me as a writer. I mean, how could you, right? Like, I, um, 
I don't know that there are, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that my writing courses have been more important than some of the courses that gave me ideas that I wanted to explore in my writing. And I'll just tell you, I've just finished a course. I've just finished a certification to become an end of life doula through the University of Vermont Medical College. It I did not expect it to be such an intense course. And I, um, so, so I wasn't expecting to work quite as hard as I did for the three months that I studied um, end of life doula work um, this past summer. But that course, it may be a while before I get to do much work with um, in that field, but it's already infiltrating the writing that I'm doing right now. So um, everything I've ever learned is, is, is information that I pull from um, um, when when I, when the need arises as I'm writing, um, whatever it is I'm writing. So it's not a particular course, but but studying and being a student is very very important. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I was I was figuring that um, figuring that that you would have a kernel of an idea that came from your course um, that we would be seeing in future works that you have. Um, you have written seven books in a play. We're focusing today on one of your earlier novels, The Rapture of Canaan, which was used as part of our Davidson online book group, which for those of you who have not had a chance to um, join us, we hope that you will consider joining our online book group featuring authors connected to Davidson. Um, for those listening who haven't yet had the chance to pick up The Rapture of Canaan, can you share a little bit about the book? I'll try. You know, this book is an old book. I wrote this book like 25 years ago um, and I had not looked back. And so I, um, I haven't thought a lot about the rapture of Canaan in the past at least 20 years. Um, it is the story about a, re a Southern religious community, um, a community held together by very patriarchal beliefs and by a very patriarchal um, grandpa who, um, who, who controls the people that he loves by making them fearful of, you know, damnation and hell and that kind of stuff. Um, the main character is Nina. She is, I think she's, she's 14 and she is um, questioning the beliefs of this community. And she's also falling in love with her prayer partner, James, who turns, who's also her, um, he's, he's like her half nephew, I think, or something like that, or her whole nephew. I don't, well, he's not related by blood. Um, he's her nephew, um, but not by blood. And, um, and so it's the story of what happens when she confuses um, being pregnant by James with being pregnant by Jesus, um, because that whole conception story happened when she was um, telling herself that she was um, receiving Jesus through James, in a nutshell. <laughs> That's a really great, concise way to put that whole thing. And I love that you said Nina. I read her as Nina. Um, and so I really like now when I reread it, I'll, I'll read her name as Nina. So Nina. Thanks, yes. thanks for sharing that. Um, if we were all gathered together where I want to be in a bookstore right now, the part that would happen next is I would ask you to do a reading. And um, since we can't be together today, um, I would love for us to try to come as close as we can to replicating the experience. Uh, would you be willing to read the part from Rapture of Canaan that really introduces the character of Grandpa Herman Langston and gives a sense of what's to come in some of the characters. And in my copy of the book, it's on page nine. Would you be willing to read that? I am us? so willing to do that. Thank I you. am. Okay, you ready? I am. This is the first time I've read this in a really long time. My grandpa, Herman Langston, was founder and preacher of the Church of Fire and Brimstone and God's Almighty Baptize and Wind. I think when he was trying to come up with a name for it, he just couldn't make up his mind. So he put all his ideas together and acted like a prophet and nobody said a thing. Grandpa Herman was a big man with red hair and huge freckles that hid in his wrinkles. He wore his blood pressure like the glaze on a loaf of bread sitting shiny on the surface. According to Nana, when he was a young man, he used his fists on anybody who crossed him, and as far as I can tell, after he got religion, he did the same thing. 
Sunday after Sunday, I watched him standing in the pulpit, banging those fists down hard on the podium, saying, there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. All around the church, penitents would be wringing their hands and crying, hollering out, amen. My daddy, Listenhuff, would be on the shelves of his knees, leaning his head against the pew and whispering loudly his private prayer to God and whoever else couldn't help hearing. My mama, Marie Huff, would be sitting or standing beside him, her scoured hands held high in the air, her face turned up to the paneled ceiling, tears falling so hard she'd have to sit her shoes out in the sun for the whole afternoon just to dry them out. Beside them would be my brothers David and Everett, and later their wives, Laura and Wanda, perfectly mimicking my parents. David was known for holding his Bible against his forehead, banging his skin into the cover until he worked himself into a holy trance. And at the other end of the pew, my oldest sister, Bethany, who was married before I was even born, sat with her husband, Olin, and their children, Pammy and Mustard, and her husband's oldest son, James, who was just a year older than me. But I sat with Nana in the pew behind them all. She'd give me a pencil and let me draw in her Sunday school quarterly once everybody got the spirit. I couldn't draw in my own because if Mama saw the mark, she'd spank me good. Nana would give me rolls of Smarties, the little candy pills that stacked up in their plastic wrapper, green, then yellow, then pink, then white, and it'd take me two hymns and one altar call just to get the wrapper open without making any noise. I always wondered where she got the candy, but feared she'd stop supplying it if I asked. Every two or three Sundays, Grandpa'd step out from behind his podium, his Bible in one hand held up in the sky, his other hand over his heart. Here he goes again, Nana'd whisper. One of these days, he's going to fall over and die right in the middle of that story. And I'd look up in time to hear him talk about liars and forgiveness. We've all sinned in the eyes of God, all of us, he'd say. My own wife, Leela, who you all know, my own wife turned her back on God, turned her sinful eyes away from God and lied, lied, lied to the courts of this land, lied to the very people who were trying to bring a murderous whore to justice. But more sinful than any of that, she lied to her heavenly father, to her king. Yes, Lord, the people would call. Just a child, just a wee child, but old enough to know the difference in right and wrong. She saw her own mother engaging in sins of the flesh and did not tell. She did not tell her father. She did not tell God. She allowed it to happen. Allowed it to happen, my mama would yell out. And on the day that her own mother pulled out a rifle and shot her father through the back so she could live in sin with a boy young enough to be her son, what did Leela do? Did she call out to God? No, Lord, my brother Everett would answer. No, no, she did not call out to God. Grandpa Herman would continue, tears sliding down his rough cheeks. I'd look over at Nana, who'd roll her eyes at me and then sneak me a wink. She did not call out to God. She crawled right in the bed next to her murderous mother and slept there. And when her mother handed her a little speech to say to the judge, she studied it, memorized it, memorized that lie. Help her, Jesus, somebody cried as if the things that had happened 60 years before were happening again. And she told that judge that her own papa, the man who loved her more than any other earthly thing, had been beating her. She told that judge that her God-fearing papa had pulled his belt from his pants and was striking her body when her mother pulled out that gun. Grandpa Herman grew quiet and sad, and a hush fell over the congregation as well. And why'd she do it, people? Why'd she lie before the greatest judge of them all? To protect her mama, Bethany hollered. To protect a murderer, Grandpa Herman corrected. To protect a whore, a wicked, evil woman. Then he fell silent to give his words a chance to settle over the crowd. But God is good, Grandpa continued. God will forgive. He'll baptize a sinner in his very blood and pull them out white as snow. We've got sinners among us, sinners who need God's blessing. God's forgiveness. Won't you come? Won't you pray to him now? Say, God, I've been a liar, a murderer, a whore. Confess your sins to the one who will make you clean. Then he'd pause and add, Sister Imogene, play us a hymn. And great Aunt Imogene would hobble over to the piano that must have been older than she was. Sunday after Sunday, we'd sing. We'd bow our heads and I'd hold Nana's hand while around me people were praying aloud, their voices competing for God's attention, growing louder and louder until I could talk to Nana and nobody would know. Don't go up there, I'd beg her. Stay here with me. I gotta go up in a minute, she'd explain. Lord knows if I don't get on my knees after this kind of sermon, I won't be welcome in my own house again. What do you do up there? I'd ask her. 
just bow my head and thank the Lord for you. And then I sing a little song or something. Don't matter what you do long as you go up there. I don't want you to leave me here, I'd say. Well, come on up with me. God knows the whole congregation will be up there anyway before Herman lets us out. So during the altar call, Nana approached the altar and whoops went up all over the church and people cried. And I heard my own mama hollering out, thank you, Jesus. I went up there with her and I could hear grandpa proclaiming, Lord, we thank you for the youth of this church, for the children who understand sin, understand their own hearts. The children with so much love inside them that they can offer it back to their own elders who are sinners. Lord, I thank you for my sweet Nina. And I smiled to myself thinking, I ain't his sweet nothing. And then I nudged Nana and kept saying my ABCs, imagining them first uppercase, then lower, thinking that periodic trips to the altar made a good impression. My whole family would appreciate me more, at least for the rest of that week. Thank you. We would all be clapping right now. <laughs> There's a little, this is so funny to me because, you know, I have that preacher in me and I can I could preach. And when I get rolling on it, like I kind of know how to get the, I know how to get the rhythm going with it. But I had put, I made a note in this book so many years ago because I got so embarrassed. I think I was out, I think I was in Colorado and I got sent on this tour when they did book tours or when they did book tours for writers who weren't very well known. And um, I think that this was even before the Oprah show. And so I was out that I would bounce from, you know, town to town. And um, I was, I believe I was in Colorado and I, um, I said, David was known for holding his Bible against his foreskin, banging his skin into the cover until he worked himself into a holy trance. Now I had written forehead, but the word skin was right behind it, holding his Bible against his forehead, banging his skin into the cover. And I said foreskin. And then I did that thing where I got a complex about it and I worried about it at every neck, every reading for, from then on. And then I would overthink it and I would just say foreskin. And that was not what I meant to do. So when I got to that place, I don't know if you can see this, but I have written head, forehead, in big letters there so that I don't misstate it. So when I saw that, it kind of tickled me right in the middle of my reading. Well, thank you. And I'm so glad to know your most embarrassing moment as well. well it, was, it was not a great one. <laughs> it was kind of a funny one looking back though. I uh, love it. And I love your hearing your voice in it because um, I, I, I read it with a Southern accent too. And it was lovely to hear you say it. Um, I'm curious, Sherry, how did the name the church of fire and brimstone and God's almighty baptizing wind emerge for you. When I got to that in the book, it just struck me. Did, did you have the name even before you had the story? No, I did not. Um, I didn't have the name before I, I um, had written the story. I came to the name, but um, when I needed to name it, that's when I came up with the name. But I love those long kind of absurd names of churches. I think that they're fun when you get, you know, the International Church of Lambs and Lions. I think I've used that one in another book at some point. Um, but just, just you know, um, these pieces and the fire and brimstone was so much a part of, you know, I grew up I did not grow up in this church, but I grew up in a hard preaching kind of church that preached the rapture, very evangelical. Um, and so I was scared to death of hell. And it was all this, everything was about hell. Every sermon was about hell. So I had that fire and brimstone and I wanted, I wanted to couple that with something that was lovely. And when I came up with um, God's almighty baptizing wind, I liked the idea of the, um, of the wind blowing through that, but I also like the blow hardness of it, right? The, the, the God's almighty wind. And I also, it just made me think about breaking wind. And it was just such a big, it was just funny. It was so gaseous, you know, and just so bloated. And I just thought it was funny. So it, I tickled myself with that name, but I, I did believe that it was the kind of name that somebody could have come up with and the whole group could have come around it and, and it, and it could work. So I went with it. That is wonderful. Thank you. I love the, the humor in the name as well. Um, we have some pre-submitted questions about the book. Um, Margaret McKibben, class of 1986, asks, how did the book idea come to you? So this book came to me. I actually, I had a dream of a baby whose hands were seamed together. And in the dream, I was the only one who knew 
that this baby wasn't praying. So that was my dream. And it was a perplexing image. I mean, it was a fun image to get. And it was a, it was an image that I kind of troubled over. And I would think, so, so it really came from that image. And I, and I was backing up from that and going, well, who would this baby be interesting to, or who would this child be meaningful for? And of course it was a religious community who b believes that this child is praying. And then, you know, well, who would be the mother of this child? Well, it would be a holy mother. It would be like a Mary. And then like, just to turn that and, you know, to, to grab it for its drama. So that's the way that this book came. That's wonderful. And Ann Culp show asked, she's class of 2000, asked, what, may, what motivated you to write a novel based within a religious community? You know, I didn't, I, I, I didn't set out to write a novel based within a religious community. I used, um, especially for my early books, the first two that I published, I, I was writing about subjects that I needed to process myself and I needed to process them to move through some of the issues that were in the books. And one of the issues was the religious background that I'd grown up in. Um, and so, um, so I, I just wrote it. I mean, I didn't, I didn't set out to do it. I didn't make a plan for it. I didn't outline it. I just, I started writing. I had this dream image. It wasn't uncommon for me to have, um, you know, dreams with religious kind of figures or imagery in them. And I just went with that. Um, so it wasn't very, it wasn't very planned. Um, I would say that I, you know, I just, I needed to process, this is not my community. I did not grow up in this church, but I did grow up in a kind of church where that kind of preaching would happen. And then that kind of um, come to God because otherwise you will burn for all eternity. And it was fearful, but my life was coupled with, so I had this religious piece and I also had this outlaw culture, total outlaws in my family. So there would always be this, this kind of tension between the things that we say we do and the things that are proper and the things that fit within this, you know, this, this religion. And then there'd be this sort of wild side that was also happening at the same time. And none of the men in my family went to church. I don't think I knew a man who went to church from, in my family for till I was like 40. So anyway, you know, it was just, um, it was, I, I was blending pieces together and in a funny way, you know, grandpa Herman, um, well, he was, um, he's a pretty rough guy. He has been a pretty rough guy. And now he's turned to religion kind of late in life. So he could have been in my family. So. Hey, sir. Sure. Um, current parent Jennifer Murphy and Sonia Miller Duzel, class of 89, asked, are there any elements in this story that are autobiographical? You mentioned that there are bits and pieces. And um, how much of this draws from your childhood? And what was the inspiration behind the story and characters? So, so, hey, Sam, um, that's a good question, and I appreciate it, and, and um, so my grandmama is the character of, um, of Nana, and that is the most autobiographical character I've ever written in my life. Now, everything I've ever written has autobiography in it, has pieces of me in it, and I see myself in in some of my characters and I find myself years later in others and feel a little bit horrified by it, but I can keep working on that. But, um, but in this particular book, the, the story of Nana and the giving, you know, seeing her mother kill her father and giving, you know, being given a little speech and reciting it to a judge and then, you know, having her mother convicted and moving in with her aunt and uncle. That's really the story of my grandmama's life. And so I, um, I, I really, I borrowed it with her permission and I dedicated the book to her. Um, and when we were, um, when the book first came out, my grandmama actually went with me to some bookstores and we had side by side tables so that I would sign and she would sign on her page too, because on the dedication page, but she is definitely the most autobiographical character and the, and I'm not Nina, but I am Nina if I had been in this community and if I had been, you know, the mother to the new Messiah, that would have been me. That didn't happen to me, but she carried the way I would have responded to some of that and, and some of my questioning and defiance and that kind of thing. And the relationship between Nina and Nana looks like the relationship that I had with my grandmama, who was my queen and who I just adored so much. And so in that regard, it really is, um, 
you know, if these circumstances had been at play, then that's how I would have acted. And that's how my grandmama would have acted. Yeah. And did you call your grandmother grandmama or did you call her Nana? I called her grandma. She was grandma. Grandma. Yeah, yeah. She's and grandma. we, you know, we changed it all up. There are a lot of, I mean, there's, there's so much that's not true in this book, but that dynamic is very much true. And the character of, of Nana is my grandmama. And did she have a swing? Because that description, there's a description you make where they're sitting on the swing together and, and where your head's in there. And then as you get yes. older, it rests on her. And that is still like one of the most comforting kinds of images that I can think of as being, you know, beneath my grandmama's arm. And, you know, my grandmama would work my legs. She would rub, rub, rub like she was. And I think I even use that in the book somewhere. Like she's trying to rub the wrinkles out of something in there. You in did. fact, my grandmama, I don't know if you can see this, but right up there, my grandma, my grandmama is right there. My grandmama, I have my grandmama in my office. I have my grandmama on the refrigerators at two different houses. So um, she's still pretty important, even though she's been gone from the world for a while now. Thank you for sharing that. Um, how did you identify the themes for the story and weave them together? I didn't. I didn't identify themes for the story. I just, I followed the story that was coming, um, you know, I, um, I was, uh, and then, so all of that is worked out later, right? Like when I'm writing, I just write the book. And then when I see something emerge thematically, or even as an image that keeps being repeated, so you could call it a symbol, right? And it can, it can be a symbol, but at first it's just what happened. Right. So at, so the first time that Nina um, th that Nina uses the rope that James used to tether himself to the, the branch of the tree, that first time she's just using it like a belt. It's just a connection to James. And then later on, when she does it again and when she starts using it, then it takes on more resonance. So I don't really think about that. But then after I've got a draft, I go back through and kind of mine those pieces and pull them out. Um, and so um, I, I didn't really set out to do it. That's just kind of how it happens. Once I see that it's in there, then I start braiding it or weaving it, as you say. Mm -hmm. And speaking of weaving the story, are we going to say something? Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say about weaving itself, you know, so I have that little opening and closing about, you know, I've spent a lot of time weaving, but you never know it from my hand. So it starts with that and it ends with that. That's all added on at the very end of the book. You know, I don't start there. I started out probably with the preaching scene. My grandpa Herman Langston, I would be much more likely to have started there. And then after the book is done, I look for ways to unify and to pull it together. So um, I didn't have that beginning and ending, but I came across Nina weaving when she was shut up in the front room of her Nana's house and she doesn't have anything to do. And she's made all the baby clothes she needs and she has these pieces and she's got, you know, her hair and she's got the rope and she's got, uh, and, and so so that emerged and then I followed it. I often feel like that, like I've, um, you know, like I've grabbed onto the tail of the horse that's running away and I'm, and, and I'm holding on for dear life and I'm like, you know, trying to follow it and, and to use what comes up. It's wonderful. And along the lines of weaving, uh, while you're a weaver of stories, are you also a weaver of textiles to be able to describe that so carefully or how did you get that? You know, I loved when I was little, those little, um, you, when, you know how you would make oven mitts? You would, did you do that? Those little, loom, string, those little that, that, that little loom thing. thing. Yes. And I love friendship bracelets that are kind of, they're different. They're, they're more of a braid, but, but to, to be weaving through that way, but I'm not an actual weaver, but I am, I like, um, I like multimedia and I like, and I find myself Whenever I need to clear my head or whenever I need to get, um, to, to, to get, well, I guess clear my head is about the best way to say it. Um, probably one of the best things that I can do is something that has nothing to do with words, no story, no, no, no narrative to it at all. And I get at that by playing with things. Um, so like, so I can show you, I actually, yeah, hang on a second. So, so I, um, so I'm kind of a weaver, like I make these kinds of things. I don't know if you can see this, but like I make, I, I pick up, I pick up 
sea glass and I pick up shells and I pick up sticks and I put them together and they make stories. There's a little person in there. There's a little walnut shell, if you can see that in there. But anyway, I, I do these things where I kind of weave things together, feathers and sticks and um, keys that I find and moss and that kind of thing. And it, and it moves me to a place of, um, it, into an imaginative place and a place where I work things out, but not with words. I have another one. I am, um, so I'm a department chair right now, and this is not a good fit for me, but I've done my best. And I've been a department chair for five years. I've got, I will finish that up this year. And it's been very difficult to have a creative life or much of one when I'm, um, when I'm in this office and I'm trying to get payroll managed, right? Or I'm trying to staff the class when somebody's walked out four weeks into the semester and I'm running in to teach, I don't know, linguistics. Anyway, um, it's just, it, it's, it's not the kind of place where I am able to, to be my most creative self. But I have been subscribing to the um, Chronicle of Higher Education for many years and I get these things and I think I should read them and I never do. And so um, I weave them. I made myself a crown out of um, about two years worth of Chronicles of Higher Education that I soaked in water. And then I um, wadded up and braided and I added some sea glass, <laughs> I added some feathers. And then when, and, and what it does is it helps me when I get in here and things get too silly or, or, or too out of control, I bring some silly back into it and kind of keep in perspective that, um, that this, is, this is all fodder for later on maybe. And maybe I'll do a little good while I'm in this role, but really, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do something with paper mache for the Chronicle of Higher Education and, and get back to my creative stuff, hopefully soon. Did you study art? No, 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 no. <laughs> you, no. you could have your own do-it-yourself show on how to yeah, craft. Yeah, <laughs> my, my craft show, my craft show, yeah, one day. Um, when I was a student at Davidson, I took this amazing anthropology course called Oral History, and we had the chance to attend the storytelling convention in Jonesboro, Tennessee. Um, your book reminded me of the cadence of those storytellers. Do you have storytellers in your family and was that cadence intentional? It's, that is an intuitive piece for me. Like the cadence is just, it's, it's in me, but yeah, great storytellers in my family. And, um, you know, um, they're usually the stories of, of naughtiness and, um, stories of, um, the secret things that people did and, um, the time they almost got killed, but didn't, or the time that they almost got caught, but didn't that kind of thing. And, um, both of my grandmother, every, there are a lot of storytellers in my family and they still, um, I can still like sometimes try to tune out the words and just hear the pitch and the, the tone of it. Um, and it's a song and I love it. So that's my, that would be one of my best days is just if I, if I could just kind of sit back and listen to the stories of, um, of, of my family. I wish I could do that again. Mm -hmm. There's something about the Southern literature where right. I feel like I hear it more. Yeah, yeah. I'm jealous of you getting to do that class, though. That sounds like it would have been a wonderful class. It was a fantastic and a, and a wonderful conference. Or yeah, yeah, it was. Um, well, we're going to go to some questions that have been posted in the chat here. Right. Um, Lib McGregor Simmons um, asks, "Do you focus your personal reading in particular genres when you are working on a novel, and what books are on your nightstand right now?" Well, um, so. I, um, so let me tell you what books are on my nightstand right now. I'll start there. So right now I'm, what's on my nightstand is a book that is just pure for just pure enjoyment. And it's called, um, The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Clooney, I think, or Clune. And it is a magical, um, a, a big magical novel about somebody who's checking out orphanages that house um, these, these misfit children. One of them is the Antichrist. And it's just wild and other, and I don't have to work too hard at it. I can just read a chapter or two before I fall asleep. And then the other one that's on my nightstand is called Cassandra Speaks. And it's about, it's nonfiction. And that one is about, um, that one is about 
what if women had been the storytellers? It's really about women storytellers and um, some of the old stories like Cassandra, like Eve um, and, and Pandora and um, how stories, who gets to tell the stories and how we um, craft a culture out of the stories that we're told. And so we really need to be telling more stories by women and women need to be, um, you know, using their voices. So those are two that are on my nightstand right now. And um, I don't really focus my reading in particular genres when I'm working on a novel. Um, I don't, I actually, when I'm writing, when I'm actually working on a novel, I'm not doing very much in the way of reading because I'm spending so much time already with story and with words that I am better served by, by something totally other. So I would be much more likely to listen to music, which I do all the time anyway, but, um, but, or, you know, walk in the woods or something like that. I probably, and I've never tracked it, but I probably read less when I'm actively writing. Now, um, you asked me early on about what my process was like, and, and I didn't tell you this piece of it. And that is, I will work on something um, in my mind for a really long time, or I'll just be sketching notes and they'll be in 40 different notebooks. And I may never find the notes again, but I'll just be working on building an idea. And then when I get started, Started, I get in fast and I try to get out fast. But that means, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of intense work, like many hours a day, and time kind of disappears for me. And I don't do it for very long because it's not very healthy, frankly. I haven't found a way to be very healthy about it. And so I go in and out kind of quickly. So I don't, I'm not doing a lot of reading at that time. But there was a time, especially early on, when I was worried about reading fiction when I was writing fiction, because I didn't want to accidentally pick up somebody else's image or line or even cadence. And so I would not read novels if I'm working on a novel. I would read poetry if I, if I was working on a novel. I like to read poetry anyway, so that's always a good excuse. <laughs> that's great. And I saw a pop up in the chat. Sam Kirkendall asked when you were talking about music, what kind of music do you listen to? Oh, Sam. Hey, Sam Kirkendall. I remember Sam. I think I taught Sam once upon a time when I came back to Davidson. Um, anyway, um, I like I like music I can sing to, and I like music that's, um, that, that I like, I, well, I'll tell you two songs that have been stuck in my head this week. One of them is the Avett Brothers, and it's um, No Hard Feelings, and that one will kind of get going in my head in the middle of the night, and I wish it would quit, but I love that song, and the other one that I've had stuck is by First Aid Kit, y'all know First Aid Kit, and it's called Fireworks. And so those are two, um, you know, I like, you know, I, I like, um, like, I like my old music. When I go to Pandora, if I just want to kind of, if I want to cook and just kind of be dreamy and, and hang out in the house, I'll tell Alexa to play some Summer Breeze Radio on Pandora. And then I'll do all those, you know, songs by America and Seals and Croft and that kind of thing. That's, um, that's comforting to me. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Lisa Chidsey asked, I mean, you talked about what you're reading now, but were you influenced by any particular writers? Yes, definitely. Um, I read Holy the Firm in Gail Gibson's um, Visionary Women Writers class. And I know Sarah Merritt, is in here, Magna is in here, and Johnny, and I say hey to both of you all. It's nice to see you here in this group, and Sarah was in that class with me, and that book by Annie Dillard, Holy the Firm, made me want to be a writer. Like, she was, she was, she was addressing, um, you know, what does it mean to, um, to, to, to live like your head is on fire, like a moth that's caught in a candle, who, you know, is, is a flame. And so Annie Dillard's works certainly had a huge influence on me. Um, her essay, Living Like Weasels, is another one that I felt um, so deeply in terms of wanting to live like a weasel that's grabbed onto the neck of an eagle and won't let go. And so the bird's flying and the bone's still hanging there and the bones have just kind of like dispersed and nothing's there but the jaw just biting in. And I'm like, that's how I need to live. So certainly um, she was a big influence. Toni Morrison was a huge influence on me. Um, and and I loved her early works, especially, and I haven't read everything that Toni Morrison wrote, but, but, um, but definitely her storytelling was very, very important to me. And there are so many more. Lee Smith, 
I got to study with Lee Smith at Davidson. Um, and no, I didn't. I met Lee Smith at Davidson and she came to judge the Vereen Bell Award. And I met her at that time. And then I followed her to VCU and she was teaching in the MFA program. And that's how I wound up there. I just followed Lee to go study there with her. And Lee was just such an important, with Lee, I realized that people um, that, that I could write stories about people like me, like my family, and that, that it didn't have to be, um, literature didn't have to be high or haughty or other, and that it could be about, you know, people at the Church of Fire and Brimstone and God's Almighty Baptism and Wind. And so I started telling those stories. They were all very important to me. That's great. Would you mind saying the name of the two books on your book stand again? And we'll put it in the chat for folks. They were people um, Cassandra Speaks is the one it's by Elizabeth Lesser and that one is the nonfiction book and House in the Cerulean Sea is the fiction book but I, and I'm loving it it's so much fun and one of the best things one of, well I like so many different kinds of books and so I am um I can find so much to like and so many ways to be happy about what I'm reading. So I don't know that these will be um, great matches or great recommendations, but those are the books that I'm reading right now. I'll tell you who I admire right now, though, if you're looking for a great new writer, and that is Molly McCulley Brown. And I'll show you her book, and I have it here because I have to introduce her at a reading next week. So I'm writing the introduction. And that's what I was doing right before we started. So this is Molly's book, and it's called um, The Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded. And um, so this is a book of poetry that is based on a real place, a historical place in Virginia. Um, and she imagines th the people who were confined at the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded. And one of the other books that's on my nightstand that I am reading right now is, is also by Molly, and it is called um, Places We Take Our Places I've Taken My Body. And that one is a collection of essays. And Molly is um, Molly has just joined the faculty here. And I think she's probably the best thing I've done for ODU in a long time to get her on board here as our newest creative writer. So I highly recommend Molly if you're looking for a poet or a nonfiction writer or somebody to come speak to your group. Molly has cerebral palsy and uses a wheelchair and she is um, and, and she writes about disabilities in all different ways. And, um, and, and so I think in terms of writers speaking about disabilities, she's probably um, one of the major writers doing that right now. Thank you so much. Um, Cecily Craig Hill Davis asks, um, how has the publishing industry changed over the decades, de decades that you've spent as an author, and how have you adapted your efforts as a writer to connect with your readers and with the marketing demands of the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. And hey, Cecily, it's good to, to see you here. Cecily had me at her book club um, maybe 10 years ago, and that was so much fun. Um, so, um, you know, I don't, so the, so the publishing industry has changed dramatically, and so have I separately from that. And I feel so fortunate that I was able to publish um, young and to get books out at a time when there weren't quite so many available. Um, at this point, it's so hard, but there are so many publishers. You can totally self-publish people are self-publishing brilliant books, and there's just, there, there are so many um there are so many books, and I feel like um, it would be very easy to get lost if you were really committed to trying to make a literary name for yourself. At this point in my life, I don't worry about that anymore. I just kind of, I go um, where I go. And so um, I worked with a particular editor who I loved for um, many years. Her name is Shay Earhart, and she was with Crown, and she had her imprint with Shay Earhart Books. And they let, that was Random House, and they, um, they basically got rid of Shay um, when, when it became, when they needed to, I guess. And so I'm, I lost Shay and I went to work with another editor that had, had bought my first book, Diane Gediman. And I went to Turner Publishing so that I could work with Diane and then Diane left Turner. And then I became a department chair and I didn't write for years. And then, um, a, an editor came 
knocking basically by email and said, do you have anything we can read? We really, we, we would love to publish you at Bywater Books. And, and I ignored her for about six months. And then she came back and said, um, I don't know if you got my last email, but I'm looking, I, I would love to read a book if you, if you have anything that's available. And I thought, well, why not? And so I ended up um, contacting my agent who I was hiding from because I hadn't been writing books and said, hey, I think I want to show this book to this editor at Bywater. And now I'm with Bywater. And so far, that has been actually a really wonderful experience for me. Bywater is a lesbian feminist press and they are small. They are clubby. I'm not great about the clubby, but I like it better better and better. I mean, I kind of feel like an outsider sometimes, but it's kind of fun. And I have had some of the um, the best editing I've ever had um, with, with this small publisher. And um, I've, I've had opportunities that I never had before. And I really don't know what's next. And I'm not particularly worried about it. Um, but I do feel fortunate that I was, that, that I'm not worried about becoming anything really I'm 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 comfortable and um and so fortunate and I can kind of um let each day go and and happen and see where it leads and so that's the approach I have to my writing right now thank you so much for that that's a um that, that's a freeing way to to be able to, <laughs> to write I love aging for this reason that's one of the best parts right like oh my god let go of all that stuff and just B. Mm -hmm. nice. um, we have time for about just two more questions here. Um, Robert Ray asks, why did you imagine that the second coming of Jesus would come through a human birth rather than have Jesus come flying on the clouds to judge the peoples on the earth? Like, how did that come about for you? I didn't, um, it, it emerged from my characters and it emerged just from the world that they were in. Um, you know, um, they were, they, they had this baby they needed for, um, they needed to make this fit. They, and, and Nina needed to make it fit, right? Like Nina had, had convinced herself that she was sleeping basically with Jesus because it was too painful and impossible for her to be actually doing it in the cornfield with her, with her cousin. And so, um, and, and so it needed to, it needed to work out. And so she made it fit. And so she created this imagined thing that she could then believe in. We do this all the time. I mean, I do this all the time where I need for something to be a certain way. And so I find um, the confirmation for it wherever in the world. And so that's just how it came in that book. Yeah. Wonderful. And I'm asked one last audience question before I get to my last question. And that is, um, this person has a daughter going to college next year who wants to be an English major and a writer. What career options are available to college graduates now that weren't options in the 90s? Well, of course, you know, everything related to social media and everything related to web development and design and all of the writing that goes in those worlds, those were not things that, that I was thinking about as an English major. Um, but I mean, I think that, in, that, that all kinds of technical and professional writing careers are the places where English majors can make the most money if that's what the concern is. Um, but to have a life of meaning, not that you can't have a life of meaning writing technical manuals, you sure can. But, um, but, but I think that, um, that, that, this, that, that, that opportunity, like I really believe that, that there's not much that an English major can't do with that degree in terms, it's, it's all about how you show it to the world and to a potential employer in terms of saying, you know, here are the things I know how to do. Here are the things I've learned in my classes. Here's how I can translate it to you, no matter who you are, where you are. So. That's, thank you. Uh, persuasive that's writing goes a long way, right? And persuasive sure speaking. So, and yeah. social media and all the right. web presence is such a, um, yeah. so, such a change now. Um, you talked a little about other writers who you love and like, but you have a new book that was just released this past spring called The Tender Grave. For those who haven't yet had a chance to read the book, can you share with us what prompted you to write it and what you hope readers will take from it and why they should pick it up now? Well, I thought maybe I would have one, but I don't, I don't see it immediately. I won't hop up to look for it. So the tender grave is a, oh, Johnny's got one. If, if, if you get off a speaker view and go to the gallery view, he'll put it right up there for you. So um, the tender grave is a story about um, two sisters. Um, one of them has committed, the younger one has committed a hate crime and has run away um, and gone to find 
her older half sister that she's never met. They share the same mother, but the mother um, had one family, left that family and started another family. So the, the younger daughter who's committed a hate crime goes off to try to escape prosecution finds this older half sister that she's never met. And that, that woman is a lesbian. And so she's in the position where she's trying to make a home with people of the sort that she has injured, right? And she doesn't want them to ever find that out. And it's the story of these two, the, the tension between these two sisters. Um, the older sister is actually, um, she and her partner are trying to have a baby. So they're doing artificial insemination. So it's a story about parenting. It's a story about sisters. It's a story about what do we owe family, that kind of thing. And one of the things, if, if you've read Rapture of Canaan, you may like knowing this. I don't know if I'll ever do anything with this or not, but I decided to make the character of Canaan from the Rapture of Canaan a very minor off-screen character in The Tender Grave. Um, and he is a fella named Cain, and he has also been a part of this hate crime. And so I don't know if I will ever play with um, what happens so much later with the rapture of Canaan, but I certainly planted that seed if I feel like going back to it in Tender Grave, so we'll see. Wow, we can have a, a trilogy, it's not a trilogy, but a follow-up book, yeah, <laughs> the, yeah. the second rapture of Canaan um, book. Yeah, Thank yeah. you so much for spending this time with us this evening, just so appreciate it, and I'm going to share the chat with you later on. Your classmates have been writing wonderful things and great advice through there. For our listeners, a recording of tonight's event will be available on our YouTube channel within the next week. And please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from our office, which will include a link to our channel. Thanks so much to our audience for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Sherry Reynolds, for sharing so much of yourself. And as Put my always, crown back on for Rocky Howe. It is always a great day to be a Wildcat. I hope you all have a wonderful night and good reading to everybody. Thank Join you all so much. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.